Margaret Garner story is very significant for our local region. M Margaret Garner was enslaved in Kentucky on a farm in Boone County uh, in Richwood, Kentucky. And it was from there that the family chose to escape on one of the coldest nights recorded in Kentucky history in late January of 1856. Margaret Garner and her family were enslaved um, less than 20 miles away from freedom um, across the Ohio River in Cincinnati. Um, this is a story that involves great courage, um, ingenuity, um, a planned escape, and of course a plan that failed. Uh, Margaret and her husband Robert, uh, Margaret's four children who were ages um, six years to nine months, and his parents, and uh, some other runaways as well who were enslaved on um, the farm of Archibald Gaines and a neighboring farm of James Marshall um, planned their escape and um, attempted to cross the Ohio River, which was frozen, um, into Cincinnati. And um, after that, of course, their plan failed. They were detected by the slave catchers. Uh, the cabin where they took refuge was surrounded. Um, a shootout occurred in which Robert was able to wound one of the deputies. But Margaret, seeing that their plan uh, would not uh, succeed, took a butcher knife and slit the throat of her two-year-old daughter. There was a trial that uh, occurred afterward, and the trial was based on the fact that the Garners, Robert and Margaret, the older Garners, the mother and father, and the children had run away from slavery. Uh, this was in violation of something known as the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. That law said that any person who was detected as a runaway would have to be returned to their slaveholders uh, regardless of whether they were found in a free state or a slave state. So in this case, the fugitive slave law actually prevailed as opposed to the uh, criminal statute, which uh, said that Margaret would be um, liable for the murder of her child. This law, written six years before they ran away, made it illegal for black people to do what is natural, and that is to be free. If you were enslaved, the law required that you stay uh, enslaved. You were a piece of property rather than a human being. They were brought before a commissioner whose last name was Pendry, and Pendry Avenue in Wyoming, Ohio, is named for Mr. Pendry. And they were brought before Commissioner Pendry here in Cincinnati um, to stand trial for running away from the Gaines farm. And uh, there was also a question of the death of the little girl. The trial, however, focused solely on whether or not they had violated the Fugitive Slave Act. These trials ordinarily took less than an hour. Ordinarily, once the owner established title to the person who was enslaved, the owner was allowed uh, to take the person back, and usually as a form of punishment, uh, the person who was returned to the farm, to the plantation, to wherever they had been owned, usually they were sold away, sold away to Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas. The Garner case was so complicated and so emotional, and because of the large number of black people living here in Cincinnati at the time, um, Cincinnati being the sixth largest city in America, we had a very large black community living right where this building is now, here on the riverfront. And that community, and the community, black community up at 6th and Broadway, in, in the neighborhood known as Bucktown, all gathered around the courthouse. Blacks weren't allowed to come into the courthouse unless they were on trial. And so their presence and the scrutiny from the press all over the United States caused this trial to go on for over two weeks before Margaret and her husband 
uh, were found guilty of violating the Fugitive Slave Act and returned to Kentucky. The trial itself uh, did a couple of things. It established whether or not Garner family, whether Margaret was owned by Mr. Gaines, whether Robert was owned by a gentleman whose last name was Marshall, who lived on the farm next to them. It also brought out the heroic behavior of Robert Garner and his father who were fighting, if you will, with one pistol against 11 armed white men, white marshals. And while they were battling them, this is when Mrs. Uh, Garner took a butcher knife and uh, dispatched her daughter. Uh, the other aspect of the story that is important is that it's a story that has something to tell us about uh, women's resistance to sexual violence. Um, it is believed that Margaret's children, three out of the four of them, were probably fathered by the white slaveholder, um, Archibald Gaines, um, as opposed to her firstborn child, uh, who was likely fathered by Robert. What was going on was is the slave owner had worked with Mr. Marshall, who owned Robert Garner, on the very next farm, and they would send Mr. Garner away for 18 months at a time. Mr. Garner would come home inevitably to find his wife pregnant, and she would give birth to a mulatto child, in other words, a child that was half white and half black. Mr. Garner was brown-skinned, as was Margaret. Um, and we get this information both from the uh, census records, which indicate that the oldest boy was um, black, male um, and five months old in 1850. The other children were described during the trial as being mulatto, bright mulatto, and the child who was killed was described as being um, almost white and a child of rare beauty. So it is believed that Margaret was um, the victim of a continuous um, series of rapes by the slaveholder. After Mrs. Garner and Mr. Garner were found guilty of violating the Fugitive Slave Act in the courtroom, after the commissioner had made his ruling, they were returned to Kentucky, and then both of them were sold downriver, if you will, to Mississippi. Margaret was never tried for the murder, nor was Robert tried for seriously wounding one of the deputies. Mrs. Garner was on a steamboat that had a crash with another boat, and she and the baby, another baby, were knocked over into the Ohio River. And when she was fished out, she no longer had the second baby in her arms. After she was taken finally on to Mississippi, she saw Mr. Garner, and she asked him to do a couple of things. One, to take care of their remaining children. Two, she asked that he not get married as long as he was enslaved. And then the following year, in 1867, she died. She died from typhoid fever. Um, I suspect she died from a, a broken heart. Robert actually survived the ordeal and um, served in the Civil War. Um, and gave an interview after the Civil War so that we know what became of the family um, up to uh, 1871. Mr. Garner returned to Cincinnati and was interviewed by the Cincinnati Gazette. And he talked about raising his sons to adulthood. And he worked here on the Ohio River, and he's buried, we think, in Price Hill in a potter's field. This family was not broken up. Mr. Garner didn't leave his wife. He didn't leave his children. He didn't leave the children that were a product of a forced relationship. We think it's one of the most heroic stories that uh, has not generally become known. And it all happened here in Cincinnati.
This is a local story. It has significance both for our understanding of family that attempted to stay together under the very br brutal system of slavery. Um, and, um, and, you know, despite all the odds, um, attempted to remain as a family unit. Blacks have always had families. When we were enslaved, it was against the law in every state in the Union for the record, the, the recognition of the black family did not exist. Yet we had families. When we left Africa, we maintained families. When we came into America, even though it was against the law, the fact that, that we have broken families now is a new phenomenon. The second thing was is that we had a will to survive with dignity no matter what the law said, and that if, in fact, that dignity was, vi dignity was violated, from the time we left the shores in West Africa until the minute we found ourselves in places like Cincinnati or Cynthiana, Kentucky, or Boone County, Kentucky, or Natchez, Mississippi, we understood that we had control of our own bodies, our own spirits. So in the ports of West Africa, black people would throw their children overboard, feed them to the sharks rather than have them being brought here enslaved. Black women and black men would attempt to jump off the bo boat at the same time. Black people would go without eating rather than be enslaved. After coming here in an effort to maintain families, they tolerated all of the indignities that were